Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Crownsman Show. I am your host, Jared Downey. This is episode 10. And today we have Drill Form Technical Services. Our guest is Jessie McDougall. She is the CFO of Drill Form. Thank you, Jessie, for coming on. How are you? I'm great, Jared. Thanks for having me. You know, I, I'm quite excited about this episode because I actually ended up spending um, in my prep. Usually I, I have a certain amount of time, but I ended up uh, quite late <laughs> going through because it's quite interesting what you've done. When Rory first booked the show, I was thought, oh, it's a it's a drill company. There, but that's you are definitely not just a drill company. Can you tell? Uh, just give that quick snapshot of what Drill Form is and what you uh, what you produce. Sure, sounds great, Jared. We are uh, an accelerated R and D company working in the upstream oil and gas. So basically we build automated drilling rig equipment. And so we specialize in one specific arm of automated drilling equipment, which is pipe handling. So one of the, the, the areas of, of the highest number of safety incidents on drilling rigs is actually around handling of pipe. And, mm -hmm. and historically it was really not very automated. And so our company focuses on building remote controlled automated units for uh, drilling rigs. If you like heavy industry, they're beautiful units. Uh, where does this all take place? Where, where are you putting these together, the design team and everything like that? Our headquarters is in Canada, in Calgary, and we do a lot of the assembly work and design work out of Canada. Um, because you've got a couple really neat products. You're going to have to forgive my bad terminology because in the industry there's there's technical terminology and then there's the actual terminology. So I, I will stumble through it and then you just correct everything that I say. Um, and there's a couple different models. I think they're called the Bulldog. I think it's what you branded them at. Can you talk a little bit about those? And then we'll, we'll bring up some pictures and everything for the audience as you kind of walk through those. Sure. So uh, our two key units uh, that Drillform makes, we call our whole intellectual property suite uh, the Bulldog series. And But the two key units that, that we build and that we have 20 plus years of expertise in, in building um, are called uh, Iron Roughneck, or we also call them automated floor wrenches, and then catwalks, automated catwalks. Mm. So both of these tools are, are designed for, um, for handling pipe on, on drilling rigs uh, with different applications. So the catwalk is a unit that moves the 30 foot long strings of metal pipe from the ground up to the rig floor and then back down again. So, uh, and then, so that's what the catwalk specializes in. And this used to be a manual process. It used to be a group of guys handling with rope and chain, moving pipe up and down from the ground to, to the drill floor. So that's that's one of the units that we specialize in, which is catwalks. And the other one is the automated floor wrench, which is also known as an iron roughneck in industry parlance. And that, mm -hmm. that is effectively a huge wrench, you know, literally just a huge wrench. So each of those 30 foot strings of pipe have threading at each end of them. And as you're coming, as you're going into the hole to drill or pulling out of the hole once you're finished, you connect and disconnect each of those 30 foot strings of pipe. And the, the tool that we designed that we call the Bulldog, uh, we have a couple different sizes of it. The, the Bulldog 160 is our, our primary tool. That has actually 160,000 foot pounds of breakout torque and 130,000 foot pounds of, of makeup torque. So it's huge, right? If you think of a Ferrari, it has 400 foot pounds of torque in its uh, in its engine, right? And we're talking about 160,000 foot pounds, right? So it's pretty, it's big machinery, yeah. So when you say break, of course, everybody in the industry watching it already knows the answer, but um, um, that when you say break torque, that's the uh, that's for when you are um, undoing the pipes, that's disconnecting. Correct. That's exactly. So when you're pulling out of hole and disconnecting pipe, that's called breaking out. And so that's why you need a little bit extra torque for that operation. And then when you're coming into hole, when you're coming into the hole, you're making up pipe. It's known as making up pipe and you need a little bit less uh, power to do that. I noticed on your website, the BD, which I assume stands for Bulldog 90, there's an automated floor wrench. So do you have three sizes or is there... We, do, we designed a smaller one uh, several years ago, the BD 90, and we have a few of those operating in the Permian Basin in Texas. 
Um, we've since designed two other models and we refer to them as the BD120 and the BD160. It's uh, 160,000 foot pounds. That's our larger model. So that that unit is for uh, offshore uh, rigs and for sort of heavy duty, heavier duty applications. Who who is their design? I was looking at your website, and um, it, it looks like you have some pretty heavy hitters in the design. Um, who is the main person that sort of puts these designs together? Because I was, I was watching how they come in. Um, again, I'll sh we'll show some little clips of the video, um, but how they work. And then I was watching, I think it was on the 160, um, they were changing out the 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 I'll call them the teeth that grab the pipe and that sort of thing. The um, it's it's the dies, yeah. yeah. It's very beautiful design. And um, who is the sort of the leads uh, that all, all these projects? Yeah, well, uh, what's what's a little bit cool about Drillform and why I even got involved uh, personally as an investor and, and started to work with Drillform about two years ago is this team has been doing exactly this kind of machinery for over 20 years. So Drillform had a, a predecessor company called Pragma which they found right. also in Canada in the late 1990s. And they were amongst the first to commercialize catwalks and, and they brought the automated and roughneck step changes forward from where the industry was at in the early 2000s. And they, um, you know, actually in the late 1990s, no drilling rig really had a catwalk on it. And now you wouldn't see a drilling rig that doesn't have a catwalk on it. it you know, so really it was that big of a transformation over a, a 20 year time frame. And, and our team was pretty pivotal in that, uh, in that transformation and through our designs. And so the, the team that founded Pragma uh, included Pat McDougall and Todd McCorriston was part of the Pragma organization, as was Mark Taggart. And so they're three of the core partners in Drillform, and they're all integral to the designs of our automated tools. And so they've each had 20 plus years, a range of both field experience where they're on the rigs and seeing how people get injured and even sometimes uh, fatal injuries around. around mm -hmm. handling. Yes, it's actually dramatic when you think there's lots of fingers and lots of toes and lots of lots of uh, personnel injuries around rig floor accidents. And, and uh, the majority of those around are around pipe handling, in fact. So. Yeah. I, so, I just saw one recently. I was at an event yeah. and there was, there was a guy that had, he got mangled pretty good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you think of it, you'll have bins of pipe, bins of 30 foot long metal pipes that have to roll onto other pieces of equipment to be moved up to the drill floor or back down from the drill floor. Any accident with those where that bin of pipes gets released and if somebody's in front of that, it can be, they can be crushed, right? So right. it's, um, you know, the way these get engineered and, and the, the kinds of safety enhancements that you can bring to this industrial operation is, is material, right? So we have a, a group of people that had field experience, often kind of 25 plus years of field experience on, on drilling rigs, who knew how things could be done more efficiently, right? Either faster, better, lighter, and, and more, more safely and removing people from what we call the red zone, which is kind of the spinning danger zone on the, on the rig floor and getting, getting them to operate these tools with, with uh, remote controls, right? And then we had mechanical engineers. So a lot of people talk about petroleum engineering in our industry, but actually we focus on mechanical engineering. So most of the people who are working on our machines uh, are, are mechanical engineering specialists. So you have to see the finite element analysis and see how all of these complex components interact and, uh, and to, to build these great tools that, uh, that are fast and light and, and provide the, the step changes and efficiency that you need. When I'm doing my research, I, I wasn't actually familiar. Again, people watching the industry will be like, really, you didn't know about this. But these catwalks, um, they really were born, not, not even the automated ones that you're doing, but the, the original ones, um, they were born out of the sort of the introduction of pad drilling into the industry. Is that right? And so there's a lot more changing over of pipes and, and, and inserting the different uh, um, tools or what it, I'm not saying it right, but the, the different mechanisms that are needed to go into the drill holes. It's just a continual process that needs to happen with the introduction of pad drilling. Is that is that where the catwalk originally kind of came prominent in the industry? And now you brought this as sort of the next level of the catwalk? 
Well, I would argue uh, the popularity of the catwalk might have predated pad drilling a little bit. Oh. But I think you're right that there's been a huge shift in um, in, in well configurations and in the type mm. of that that uh, that the companies are drilling that has brought about you know that has certainly accelerated the use of catwalks and and part of that is so when when in our predecessor company so it was called Pragma that was uh, based in Canada. And we actually sold in 2006 to a NYSE listed uh, company, Neighbors Industries. Uh, so their subsidiary, Canrig, bought Pragma and all of its uh, intellectual property in 2006 for a phenomenal return on in investment for, for our founders. Um, but they, uh, at the time, were designing for, as, as you're referring to, they were designing for very different well configurations. These were much more shallow wells and sort mm. of and medium duty applications on the wrench. So in terms of the torque specifications and requirements, they were much simpler at that time. And now what you see is more modern well configurations are drilling much deeper wells and they're drilling much more horizontally. And so the demands on the equipment that we that we built in the late 1990s are just completely different to what the current conditions are. So, um, so actually, that's in a way what prompted us to to found Drillform after selling Pragma in 2006 was to say, okay, now we we built these great tools, the the Torquematic or the TM80 and the TM120. These are the predecessor wrenches that we designed. Hundreds of these are operating globally, and they're fantastic tools. But they were designed for a lighter kind of application, more shallow wells and less precision on the torque was, was required at the time. So we realized the, the industry had really shifted. There are greater demands from pad drilling. There are greater demands from going deeper and doing more horizontal drilling. And in fact, there's been a huge evolution in R&D on drill pipe itself. So mm. drill pipe has become much more sophisticated and more complex. And in fact, there's premium drill pipe now that has double shoulders on it, which makes it more difficult to make up with those older fashioned uh, mm. on the floor, floor wrenches. So what we did is we designed for modern applications. We said, let's build for premium drill pipe so that we can handle those double shoulders and let's build so that we can be highly precise on each connection and disconnection. And let's do data acquisition. Let's let people have remote control uh, diagnostics and troubleshooting, right? So even on machines that historically used to not have that, we can provide connection by connection what happened on every single connection. And that can be hugely beneficial for drillers and operators when they're looking at maybe expensive downhole problems they've had. They can say, well, was it due to that one string of pipe or did somebody not make up that pipe correct correctly and it caused a really expensive downhole problem? And that's the kind of data that we can provide and assist with efficiencies of operations. It's so interesting. Like I said, when because um, Rory Bamford, our producer, he 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 brought the show to me, and I went, "Oh, it's a drill." I heard drill form, and I went, "Oh, a, a drill company, good." And then I uh, then a couple days later, I opened up the file. I went, "Oh, oh, I'm going to have to do some research on this one because <laughs> it's very interesting what you're doing." Let's, uh, let's highlight just the different models of the catwalk. Can you walk us through uh, both those units um, and the differences between them? Yeah, in fact, we have even more models than that. I think we, we, we've, got, uh, we've got several versions of what are called service rig catwalks or, or workover rig catwalks. And so those are a little bit smaller units and they're for different mm. applications than drilling. Um, and so we have a, a number of units of those right from not very automated push-up versions all the way through to uh, automated remote controlled service rig catwalks. And we also have three series right now of drilling rig catwalks, and we call them the Bulldog 441, the Bulldog 442, and the Bulldog 443. And what that really means is the 441 is a single, so it handles singles of drill pipe, and the 442 handles doubles, so you can connect up two pieces of 30-foot drill pipe, and you can handle that and bring it up and down to the drill floor in a doubles format, already, already made up as a double. And then we also have tri a triple handler, the, the, the BD443, and that one will take triples of drill pipe up to the drill floor and back down. And so the efficiencies that that, um, again, when it's, it's about what we discussed about the evolution of, of well configurations. When you used to drill in Western Canada, maybe a couple, a couple thousand feet down, 
maybe the efficiency of going one pipe at a time wasn't such a big deal. But if you're now looking at, we're on, for example, a 38,000 foot well, um, mm. you know, when you can make them up in triples and then, you know, uh, drill and, and pull out of the hole in triples, this is much, you can, you can save significant productive time. So a lot of these rigs, their day rates, they have rental day rates that can be, if it's an offshore rig, it can be well in excess of $100,000 a day. So if you can save even a few hours a day of tripping time by making up in doubles and triples, you can save them. You can, you can save the cost of the unit in a matter of six months, you know? So it's really phenomenal actually. So that's, so that's why we have different sizes of, of units. We talked a little bit about the history of the company already. And, um, you know, I, I think, I think this would be a good time to actually shift into some of these projects. Now, I understand, I mean, especially in the industry that you're serving, you can't necessarily say, oh, we're on this site and it's working for this. So, you know, I, I won't push the point of where everything is, but can you highlight a couple projects? I know you've got some overseas. You've got some interesting projects, uh, down into South America doing some offshore. Uh, can you highlight a couple of those? Sure. Yeah, we're on some very exciting projects right now. So I know the market, the oil and gas market right now is really tough, but actually mm -hmm. because we're, we're in the art, we're an R&D accelerator company, we're not really competing in a commoditized space, you know, we're head to head with kind of older technology. We actually feel we've, uh, we've, we've had good fortune in, in this market. We, our technology was selected on a Middle Eastern, a, a very large scale Middle Eastern infrastructure project. It's actually an offshore man-made island project specifically for uh, drilling rigs and they're, they're large rigs. And it's actually an, a national oil company that's partnered up with ExxonMobil. So we were selected on that, uh, on that rig for our iron roughneck technology. And it has performed really, really well. And these are tough operating conditions. Let me tell you, Jared, it's, um, uh, it's 80 plus percent humidity most days. And it's, you know, often over 50 degrees Celsius, right? So it's, it's difficult operating conditions, certainly. And, and our, our wrench has performed really, really well. And this is also a difficult well configuration, aside from the environmental con uh, uh, conditions. It's actually 10,000 foot drilling straight down and then almost 30,000 feet horizontally from there. So it's one of uh, the, the longest wells drilled in the world. Not the longest, but it's close, but not there. Yeah. I keep trying to tell guests, well, you need to bring us on site to do some of these interviews. And then you went, I said that, and then you went through the details of the environment. And I went, ah, well. No, yeah, no, it's tough. It's really tough. <laughs> and, and actually, they're really strict about getting visas to get people on um, onto those islands. And, and you have to have offshore helicopter training to be able to be a technician and even to go and install one of these units. It's, it's really it's, it's quite complex, you know. Oh, and I was just going to ask, actually, um, something that al always interests me about newer technology. Even, I mean, newer in the industry being within 10 years. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's such an old industry. When you are in a major project like that, in a harsh environment and strict rules and policies and all this type of thing, when the equipment comes on site, when your product lands on site, does the equipment continue to evolve on site? Um, or like, do you continue to develop it or does it have to come and be absolutely ready to work, working condition, or is there an opportunity to go, oh, we're running into this problem. Okay, we need to upgrade this and adjust this. You know, that's a great point, Jared. There are certain units that they really don't want to see any non-productive time stemming from a new or prototype unit. Uh, but we were very fortunate with that uh, offshore project in the Middle East in that um, we sent them a relatively new unit. And uh, although we have hundreds of these operating in the field of different uh, iterations, uh, but there were some innovations in this. And, uh, and actually we have made some upgrades due to the operating conditions there on the back of it, but they were really at our choice as opposed to, you know, mm. it working and, and needing to be uh, amended. But, but that you're absolutely right. That's an interesting point because what we try to do is as much testing in advance of it going on to a site. And if we can put it on with an operator who knows our history of equipment uh, from the last 20 years of designs that we've, we've put into the field and they understand, okay, we're, and, and also you have to send out fantastic field service techs. So you have to send yeah. out really experienced people who can tear that thing down and build it back up in almost no time. 
um, to give them the confidence that, uh, that, that you're going to have a unit that really supports their operations. So you're, ab you're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just, yeah, I, I, found, I found it interesting. And because, uh, of course, when you've got a technology, you, you're, as you do every project, there's going to be feedback. And, and in some cases, can you upgrade it during the actual operation? Or do you have to wait till the next project before you can implement those? It's, it's always a challenge of technology, right? It is. And, you know, we, one of the design features that my colleagues are most focused on is trying to make it really serviceable in the field. So the idea mm. is we have a really modular design, and I think you saw the videos of the yes. eye change-outs and the cylinder change-outs. And I think if you're familiar with our, the competing Iron Roughnecks, you, you know, it's really eye-opening that you can change those in minutes and on-site, mm. whereas some of these things require to be sort of taken out of service and maybe multiple hours or even days or, or, or taken, taken away to be reserviced and change, change out certain spare parts. So... That's a really big difference in terms of uh, reducing non-productive time for operators, right? And making it easy, you know, ideally, I think a lot of field service techs charge about 1,500 a day, US dollars, 1,500 a day to come on site and to do repairs and, and change outs. And so if we can sell a unit to an operator that they can do the change outs themselves really easily, really readily, we can save them tens of thousands of dollars a year in ongoing maintenance uh, costs. So just to give you a ballpark um, sense, a lot of these units cost somewhere in the range of 500,000 US dollars, but the operating costs can be, for our units, often 30,000 to $50,000 a year. But it's not unheard of, of for Iron Roughnecks, particularly in very difficult operating conditions, to have $300,000 a year of operating costs. So mm -hmm. imagine, you buy a unit that costs you four hundred or five hundred thousand dollars, and then it costs you another three hundred k per year to to keep it running, right? So the the cost of whether you have to have a service tech on site and whether you can do some of the the maintenance yourself, and also how durable the unit is for the heavier duty applications becomes. It's not just about the ticket price; it's about the ongoing uh, cost of operations, right? Cost of ownership. When I, I saw that you're the CFO of company, we haven't actually had a lot of CFOs on the company. And I, I know you have that, that technical knowledge that, that you've developed from working with the company, but it's nice to see when it's always interesting with people that can approach it from that financial side, that are able to break down the numbers very smoothly in correlation with the, uh, the product. So uh, it's, it's very interesting. I think there's one more project we should highlight. I think it's down in Brazil. Do I have that right? I think it's a big offshore project. Yes, it is. So we're, we're very excited about it. Um, our technology, again, it was our Iron Roughneck, uh, the offshore model, the BD-160 uh, floor wrench. That was selected by uh, a company called Atlantica, and they run tender assist rigs. They're based in Houston. Um, they've been doing this for a very long time. They're very experienced with, uh, with our technology as well as uh, the competing Iron Roughneck technology. And they could not be more excited about our wrench, which we agree with. And they, they selected it for um, the Papa Terra project, which is a Petrobras and Chevron partnership. And it's a deep water offshore Brazil project. And this is a huge, a huge project for, for Petrobras, and we're very excited to be selected um, as a technology on that project. It's really high profile for us and, and, a, and a great uh, forum to collect even more field data on that great wrench. So, yeah, we're, we're very excited to work with them. I'm going to do a pure plug for the company right now, because, but it's an important one. What percentage of it is the technology that's giving the co a company like Drillform these opportunities, or what percentage it, is it of the approach? I mean, obviously, there's a huge cost savings, there's safety, there's these all these value adds that you have, but you still have to service it. You still the company still has to want to work with you. What do you what do you think is the balance there? Um, with the reason these companies are giving a comp uh, Drillform these opportunities on these major projects. Well, I think you raise a great point. It's absolutely a mix. I think it's hard to break down an exact percentage, but you're absolutely right that you don't win 100% on technology or price. You have to support it with really great field service. You have to support your equipment with really great field service. So we actually don't hire the cheapest technicians to come and work with mm. us. These are people who actually know how to assemble the equipment and really, really know how to repair it. And so when we send someone on site, you get a knowledgeable and really experienced person to, to help repair and troubleshoot. So 
And that's not, um, that's not simple, right? And so, I, but I think it's key because you basically aren't going to win uh, in terms of putting a brand new technology on an expensive operating uh, site uh, if you can't support it with, with good field technicians. So, and, and a lot of the competing um, equipment manufacturers have big service teams and, and you know, with, you know, mixed reviews of how that, that comes out in, in, in the wash. But I think um, you have to have both. You have to have uh, great technology and you have to have a great field service team. But I would say one of the reasons that we're, we're winning business, particularly with that iron roughneck, is a lot of the technology that we're competing with is as old as our old technology or older. Yeah. So when we sold our technology to neighbors Canrig, they have made barely any changes since 2006 to those units. And as I mentioned, wow. I know, and as we discussed, the market has significantly moved on in terms of the types of wells that those units are meant to be operating on. So if you can demonstrate that you have, let's say we think our torque precision so the, versus what they're targeting on a makeup and what we can achieve on a makeup, we're plus or minus 0.25%. You know, that's our accuracy level. And our, a lot of our competitors are in the plus or minus 5%. That's so material in terms of uh, precision and, and savings on downhole problems that you can go to an operator and say, look, we save you on uh, not damaging the drill pipe, on being able to handle premium drill pipe, on torque precision, and, um, and, and we save you on ongoing maintenance costs. And that can, you know, that's, I guess, the technology winning the deal, right? And if we can demonstrate that there is no competing technology that is, that is operating in that kind of level, which I think is the case right now, um, then, then we, we have to win that business. Like, I, I really don't see why in five years' time anyone would have an iron roughneck without the features that we have right now because they're just yeah. so, dif they're so differentiated. What happens is sometimes very large companies have a suite of intellectual property and they want to monetize it over time. You know, the less you can invest, the more you kind of squeeze out of the cash flow, right? Of mm -hmm. an, old, an old intellectual property suite. So that's, to some extent, you know, that's the incentives of a larger firm. And also, I think there's an interesting thing about small companies versus large companies in terms of R&D. And you'll probably see that a lot in your in your interviews is that large companies, when they try and do R&D, they use a huge team, a big committee, and they take years and years to do it. And they probably do it at about five to 10 times the cost that we would, right? Mm -hmm. So that just makes, you know, we can do a lean R&D kind of fast process and really blue sky. We don't have to protect legacy technology that we need to kind of milk the cash flow out of. We don't have to do that, right? whereas some of the competitors do have to do that. So I think it's a mix. We went on the technology because we're really taking the step change forward, but you have to have the service alongside or you won't win. That's, so it's mix. It's a mix. That is, that is very, very well laid out, Jesse. And, and I think, and that's why I, you, you were a little hesitant. You didn't want to make it about yourself. And, but you know, I, I think it's important, uh, especially hearing how you lay that out. You know, a team is made up of, of people that bring different skill sets and sometimes that's from very different industries. And, you know, I, I, you know, going on your LinkedIn and seeing that, seeing sort of what your professional journeys, I mean, you were, a, you were a visiting pr professor uh, somewhere. Um, you came out of, you, you know, you were, I think you were in investment banking. Uh, let, let's, let's spend a few minutes talking about you know, what that, what that journey was for you and then what that brings to the table now for working with a company like Drillform. Thanks, Jared. I, um, well, I did start out in investment banking. I started out my career in investment banking. I actually worked for a Canadian investment bank called BMO Nesbitt Burns, which was an arm of Bank of Montreal. I worked for them out of Toronto and then also they had a, a branch office in London in the UK. So I worked out of both of those offices uh, in investment banking. And after that, I, I studied at London Business School, and then I worked as a proprietary trader. So I was an investor for a long time. Um, I worked at Barclays Capital and in their investment banking arm. And, uh, and then what happened was in late 2017, I, I've also founded a, a, an investment fund, and then I sold that. Uh, that was in the UK. Um, but in late 2017, one of the founders of Drillform actually came to me just for advice, totally unrelated, not a compensated discussion. 
they came to me um, asking for advice about a financing structure that they were looking at accepting from an institutional investor. And they showed me the, the, the term sheet and they said, what do you think about this investment? And I looked, you know, of course, I had to learn a little bit more about the company to understand, well, why would you want to be interested in a financing like this? And, you know, what is your, what is your intellectual property suite like? And what's the use of capital, et cetera? And once I dug into it a little bit further, I thought, well, this is really, really exciting, right? This is, this is you know, you're competing in a field where some of the competing technology is 15 years old. So this team used to be the, the, at the forefront of catwalks and iron roughnecks. And then they, they sold that entity, restarted, and they're still at the forefront of this technology. And I thought, you know, as a finance person, you think about efficient markets, right? You're, you're, uh -huh. you're drilled into you in your education that markets are efficient and people are constantly trying to compete. And here we were in a space where fast forward 12 years, the, the competitors really hadn't even caught up with this, this team that were innovating in the space. And I thought, well, that's very exciting. And so I actually personally invested and accepted a role in the company in, in early 2018 after I, after I dug into it a little bit harder because I thought, well, this is exciting. You know, this, this, this can only go one way. This, is going, this, is, this technology is going to take over the industry. So, so, but it isn't very linear. I'll admit that to you, Jared. <laughs> You know, I, I have been investing for a long time, but in very different types of instruments than drill form. That's true. Yeah, I, I, I'm curious about something, and it's you know, you know, you and I outside of this show. I mean, we we're in different circles, so you don't always get a chance to talk to to people with, with your particular background that have now went into heavy industry. I mean, you said you're an actual investor, so you you put your money there and your time in. Um, what? What is the through line for you, or multiple through lines, because I, th I think most people have a couple, that sort of is your approach to the success you had? And you, you obviously have had a lot of success and are continuing to expand on it. Is there a couple sort of key values that you bring with you sort of in whatever you're doing that you think have sort of dictated, or have those values changed as you've, have you've expanded into your career? I, I think... I think I bring a lot of hard work to to both drill form and the roles that I that I did before. I was a keen researcher when I was uh, when I was a portfolio manager and investigating different investment strategies. Mm. Uh, I really enjoyed that process. Actually, that's tremendously fun. And um, I, I actually felt there was a big multiple uh, return. I thought it was a little bit of a contrarian play. I, I'll admit to invest in oil and gas in this market. It is a contrarian play, but I'm not afraid of doing that. And, um, and, and that would be a thread running through my career as well, actually probably making mm. some, some contrarian plays. Um, but I, I'm comfortable doing that. And I, I actually do have a reasonably high risk appetite. I mean, I did found, I founded, a, I co-founded an investment fund and, and ran it for six years in the UK. And that's not for the faint of heart either. <laughs> no, not, not even a little bit, no. Not even a little bit. And, and <laughs> an investment in, in drilling rig and oil field services equipment is also, you know, it, it's, it's not for the faint of heart. It's a highly volatile sector, but I absolutely knew that going in. You know, I think if you've done any uh, sectoral investments and analysis, you would you would know that. And so, um, yeah, I guess those are the things I brought to the table. But uh, and I had also founded and and done a lot of the administration and, and operated as the CFO at that investment firm. And then I also sold that company. And uh, and so I think those things I, I thought I could bring to drill form and 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 provide utility to a team. You know, the team is largely engineering and operations. So the, my team is used to building at huge scale and engineering. You know, large scale and complex projects. So some of the machines have thousands of components in them. You know, so it's really a complex operation, even just from the point of view of creating a bill of materials and and executing on it. Right. So. Uh, they're multi-month builds for one one unit, right? So it's um, yeah, it's highly complex. So, uh, but they didn't really have finance uh, background in in their team. So that's what I, I felt I could bring to the table for them. And it's been uh, they're an amazing team to work with. Yes, it's very different than working in London um, at an investment bank, but in a really fun way, I have to say. It 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 sounds it sounds fun, and there's. 
You know, and there's a little bit of a theme that I've noticed with the the show that we didn't, you know, we didn't have a target to have. We just ask the questions and we get the answers. And and one of it is that the people that seem to have success and continued success is they have a whole bunch of tools that they've developed. You know, they have, like you said, they the research, understanding principles of the market. Um, and they've taken risks like yourself. You've taken major risks, but not without the proper tools in place to be able to tackle those risks. And it's such an important, you see a lot of, uh, you know, if you go onto, let's say, social media, you'll see a lot of people talking about risking everything. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, take a risk once you have those tools. And that that's certainly from what you're saying in your career, you've developed those tools that gave you the capability to take those risks. I would agree. I think I think you you want to think you have an edge when you're taking a risk, right? You don't yes. want to take risks randomly. You want to believe that you have an edge that actually makes that decision less risky, right? That you have some sort of level of insider knowledge or uh, market knowledge that allows you to 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 believe that you're not taking as big of a risk as it looks like to an outsider. But I would agree, and, and multi-skill set. I mean, we're a relatively small firm. We have three locations, so we're based in Abu Dhabi, uh, Canada, and in Texas. I'm in Texas, in fact, and um, we we have these three facilities, and we're a small team, and we need to wear many hats as a small group, right? So I would agree with you on that multi-skill set idea. You're not just doing one thing in a small firm. You you don't just have one role. You're not, you're not just creating financial reports. No, there's much more to it with a small team, right? Jesse, thank you so much for coming on the show. When I realized what Drillform was doing, I realized it was going to be a good show. And then combining the technology with your background, um, it was really good to have you on. Thank you for joining us. Um, you know, I hope the people watching uh, gain as much from it as I gained uh, the knowledge I gained just doing the interview. Thank you so much for having me, Jared. It was really fun. I think you have a great mandate and a very exciting show. So thanks very much, Jared. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, everybody. Well, um, if if you didn't enjoy that interview, I, I'll be honest, I think you're watching the wrong show. Uh, Jesse brings so much. Um, thank you for watching. Thank you for your support. Thank you to the guests. Thank you to the sponsors. Subscribe, comment, and we will talk to you on the next episode.